despite unprecedented money printing continuing, the dollar remains resilient. Stock markets stay firm and bond yields are lower. To give us his interpretation on what's really going on in financial markets, I'm talking with Louis Gav of GavCal, who also gives us his views on Bitcoin, central bank digital coins, and watch out for some key insights into the recent flash crash in precious metals. And remember, as always, if you want to see more interviews with industry experts and thought leaders in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. And if you want to learn more about how you can buy, sell, and store gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts. Louis Gav, welcome back to Goldcore TV. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. Now, it's been about uh, six months since we've had a chat. And last time that we were on, we talked about some wide ranging topics. And one of the predictions that you had was around inflation and that we were going to see some high prints and that those high prints were going to have some knock on implications for stock markets. They were going to have knock on implications for gold markets and bond markets. Um, here we are having seen some very high prints in inflation in the US. And we've still got stock markets near their all-time highs. What on earth is going on? It's a tough one, to be honest. The um, uh, the stocks are one thing. The, the real quandary, to be honest, is the bond market. Um, mm. You know, the uh, and I don't want to change the topic to not answer your question. And I'll try to answer it on the stocks as well. But, you know, you look at it. I think when we spoke, inflation was around 2%. We're now, you know, basically having prints of 5.4, 5.5%. We've had over the same period, we've had oil basically go from 50 bucks to 70 bucks. And I think if you and I, you know, had 2020 vision back then, and if we'd known that inflation was going to be five and a half, if we'd known that oil was going to be 70 bucks, we probably would have concluded that the, you know, 10 year treasuries would get absolutely crushed. Yeah. Um, And, you know, here you are with bond yield still at 1.3, you know, and in the past four or five months, we've gone from, you know, the high of 1.75 back down to 1.3. So to your question, what is going on? Um, I think you've had two big tailwinds to the bond market and that this then has impacted stocks. Um, I think that the two big tailwinds to the bond market has been renewed fears uh, around COVID and Delta variant, et cetera. I think when you and I were speaking, um, we were basically vaccines were starting to be rolled out. Everybody was getting excited. Uh, there was a feeling that, um, you know, we're starting to see the end uh, of the the light at the end of the tunnel, um, et cetera. And, you know, here we are six months later. And yes, parts of the world have reopened, but other parts of the world are still very much, you know, following zero COVID policies. China's still locked down. Australia is still locked down. Etc. And you know you, you can't pick up your newspaper without hearing about the Delta variant that's so much more contagious. You know, the fear on COVID keeps on being fed, even though hospitals are empty, even though you know number of deaths have plummeted, even though as you and I were talking a minute ago before we started, you know the the vaccines are being rolled out with some success in most most I would say rich countries. Mm. Um, so. You've had you've had the delta fear, and to me, I look at this fear and I try to relate it to numbers, and that fear is irrational. Uh, it's basically, and I don't think it's going to last. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, I think that the other very big thing you had uh, was China was tightening, um, and you know China is the number two economy in the world. While the U.S. was easing, etc., China itself uh, was tightening monetary policy. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, tightening regulatory policy and you know cracking down on its fast-growing internet sector, um, and this also fed investor fear. Um, the Chinese stock market, you know, basically peaked in uh, in February, uh, went down by almost a third, um, and you had you know, as a result, I think you had you know the fear of oh my God, China is making a policy mistake, they're going to uh, uh, that's going to trigger a rollover in growth in emerging markets. That's going to roll over to trigger a rollover in global growth. Um, I better put my money back in U.S. Treasuries and back in the big anti-fragile U.S. stocks like Google, Facebook, Amazon. And that brings me to your point about stocks. Yes, the stock market is making new highs, 
uh, but it depends on what stock market you're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're looking at the S&P 500, uh, which is you know dominated now by these behemoth U.S. tech stocks, yeah, then yes, that's making a new high, uh, because I think that you've had two things happening. As people sold Alibaba and Tencent because of the crackdown, they turned around and they bought Amazon and Google because it's like you know I'll get out of Chinese tech and go into U.S. tech. So that was one thing, and then the other thing was in a world where you're worried about Chinese growth rolling over and hitting emerging markets, where you're worried about uh, the Delta variants hitting growth around the world, then you go back to you know growth at any cost, which is Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, et cetera. So you know, yes, the stock market have gone up, but they've gone up on very few names. So if you take the Russell 2000, you know the Russell 2000 is basically down a little bit since making a high in March 15th. Uh, yes. Meanwhile, then uh, over the same period, the Nasdaq is up 16 or 17 percent. Hmm. So, uh, and that's before you go into, let's say, the MSCI emerging markets, which is you know not a pretty picture. Um, if you look at the past 10 weeks alone, the performance gap between the Nasdaq and the MSCI emerging markets is 20 percent, which very so you know that kind of a performance gap over a 10 week period usually only happens in periods of deep crises. Um, and yet here we are uh, with with a massive gap uh, that would seem to indicate a massive crisis. So I, you know, I don't think, um, you know, your point is stock markets are making highs, yes and no. Lank, in this last sentence, something, uh, is something going to trigger? Well, uh, I, I, I think from here, you really have two options. The first is to think, okay, China is going to continue tightening until the Chinese economy goes into a recession. I think we now know that this isn't going to happen. China has already basically come out and said, we're done. You know, they've cut the triple R ratio, uh, the, the reserve requirement ratio. So they've already done that, basically indicating that they were done tightening. Um, and, you know, when the stock market tanked a couple of weeks ago, they basically rallied all the banks to, in essence, put a floor on the stock market. Um, so I think you know the China fears are now mostly behind us, um, the, and which leaves you with the Delta variant fears. Uh, and here the big question is: Okay, as we you know come out of summer, go into the fall and the winter, does the Western world lock down again on the back of this Delta variant, or do we just learn to live with COVID? Um, so, and and I think we learn to live with it, but I might be wrong. And we talked a lot last time about the movement of money from um, from west to east, uh, which has been going on over the last number of years. What you're saying there is kind of there's been a bit of a shift back. There was money moving basically east to west over the last couple of months. Would you agree with that then? Uh, on the equity side, there's no doubt. You know, I yeah. think if, if you're a foreign investor into Chinese equities, you know, everything that's happened in the past two to three months has led you to the conclusion that China is uninvestable. Um, you know, the... You know the taking down of DD Chuxing, the taking down of the education stocks. You know every everybody invested in Chinese equities has been so painful, uh, and all the pain has come basically from the government's hand. That you know the, the conclusion for most individuals in equities has been, oh, I can't be invested in China. Interestingly, you don't have the same conclusion on bonds and on the currency. Mm -hmm. um, and in this crisis in China or this you know bull market, this bear market in China over the past uh, six months or so, um, it's very different than the last one we saw in 2015. In 2015, when equities tanked, Chinese bonds were very volatile and the renminbi went down. Uh, and that the renminbi going down provided a big deflationary shock for the world. Hmm. Uh, because you know, in a world where everything is produced in China, when the renminbi goes down, it makes everything cheaper. Um, this time around, it was interesting. Stocks tanked, the renminbi started to go down. And even as stocks continued tanking, the renminbi came straight back up. Um, and I, to me, this was, of course, a sign that the government was in, intervening to keep the renminbi strong. Um, and so this means that you know, RMB bonds remain you know, the best performing bond market over the past 12 months, over the past three years, over the past five years, over the past 10 years. Um, and so um, it is you know, a strong renminbi is actually inflationary for the world, not deflationary. So I think that's, you know, the, the, there's a shift there. So I think, you know, foreign money is gonna keep pouring into RMB bonds and into the RMB itself as a currency, as the RMB becomes, you know, a bigger and bigger part of 
global trade and as China looks to settle more and more of its trade in its own currency, uh, that trend is going to continue. But foreigners pouring money into Chinese equities, uh, I think that's uh, definitely on pause. Uh, keeping with currencies then, the US dollar has been extremely resilient, I suppose you could say, given the continued massive money printing that is going on. Is that something that you'd agree with? Um, I'd put it a bit differently. I would say, yes, it, for sure it's been resilient, but I, I would put it a bit differently. I would just say the exchange markets have been amazingly boring. Um, okay. You know, I mean, if you look at the past six months, you know, what's happened in the exchange rate market? You know, a whole lot of nothing, right? I mean, we can get excited about a percent here or a percent there, but, uh, you know, that's that doesn't really move the needle, right? Mm. Um, you haven't had any sort of 10, 20, 30 percent move in currencies uh, for a while. Uh, so, no, I th look, I think the, the U.S. dollar took a leg down with COVID as it became clear that the U.S. dollar, that the U.S. authorities, the Fed, uh, but also the U.S. Treasury were basically being more aggressive than anybody else. You know, if you look at 2020 in the U.S., the increase in debt per capita was about 13,000 U.S. dollars in the U.S., in most European countries, it was between four and six thousand uh, dollars. So the U.S. basically did two or three times as much stimulus as what Europeans did. Um, so you know there was a, a, as the market realized this, I think there was a leg down on on the U.S. dollar. Since then, we've been range trading, right? I mean, Absolutely, there's been yeah. it's been it's been a whole lot of nothing. Um, and you know, I think you know it's been a confluence of factor. First, there was well, the U.S. is reopening. So that's good news. Uh, Europe is Europe reopening? Yes or no? It was sort of fits and starts. You know, it's like yes, we're reopening, but we're not letting the Brits in. Uh, yeah, and uh, yes, we're reopening, but we're staying within our own countries and like different countries following different rules. It was all a bit confusing. Um, so you know, I think this basically put a bid under the U.S. dollar. But you know, looking further. Um, um, you know, I, I still think I look at the fiscal situation in the U.S. I look at the monetary situation in the U.S. You know, I think right now what's supporting the U.S. dollar is the belief that the Fed is going to announce some tapering and some some mild tightening of monetary policy in the next six to 12 months. Um, we're getting getting more hypersensitive to that, though. I mean, we're we're, yeah. we're we're seeing moves on the back of maybe we might have a quarter of a basis point in a year or two's time, and we're starting exactly. to react on the batter, back of that. Yeah, but I think it's unlikely we'll we'll have that. I think when you look at the U.S. fiscal situation, the reality is, the, I don't think the U.S. can afford much higher interest rates. Um, so it's a real so, case. It's a real case of buy the rumor, sell the fact. Then, yeah, I think so. Or they're I just so. using the 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 narrative and the dialogue to. To 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 effectively try and control the markets, I think so. I think so. So we're struggling really for direction at this moment in time. Yeah, I think. Look, um, well, you know, currencies are boring and they're not going anywhere. Um, bond yields are in essence range trading, and the one place you've had direction is the five big tech stocks, and so all the money is all the money is pouring into that. Um, and, you know, every momentum trader in the world, uh, every algo, you know, they just do what works and this is what's working. So, so, so we're doing this, um, having said that, I think there is an important change unfolding. Um, and that is that if you look at the past, what is it? Four or five months now, bond yields were falling from 175 to, to, to 115. Uh, they're now on the rise. Um, bond yields are, are back to rising again. And in a world that, uh, you know, if, if, as I believe, we go past this Delta variant and the world reopens more or less, et cetera, I think we'll be back at 175 or 2% very, very quickly. Uh, and in that environment, as the bond yields change, you know, a lot of other momentum changes. Um, how, how does the U.S. economy, or how, how, do they, how do they roll over debt, an increasing amount of debt at uh, at at two percent. Can they do that, or is that when we start to see things crack? Uh, if, as long as the Fed keeps printing, they can do it. You know, the Fed. You know, the Fed. The Fed is basically at this point buying any new net any net new issuance. Uh, I think they're buying like ninety between ninety and ninety five percent. So, but surely something's got to give. Then at at a, at a certain stage, that that has to 
to to burst i mean is it the dollar that goes or yeah. and it's or? the dollar then yeah. it's the dollar that goes as the market realizes hold on the fed cannot taper the fed cannot step back from buying these us treasuries that's when the dollar goes and I can't remember who it was that says, you know, markets can stay irrational for longer than you can say it solvent. Keynes. It's, uh, it, was, Keynes. it was Keynes who, who knew. Who he, I think he he basically went bankrupt three times and had to be bailed out by his dad. Uh, <laughs> so uh, who was, who was uh, a lot of money. Um, so, yes. and But, you know, other times he made a lot of money, but he was actually quite a strong risk taker, uh, Lord Keynes. So I want to touch on gold and silver in a moment, but uh, in a roundabout way, I want to talk about cryptocurrencies first, because one of the things that has happened since last we talked is the increase in the narrative around central bank digital coins. Um, we've also seen a lot of volatility in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular, falling from over 64,000, it's high down to, it went below 30,000 briefly there. Uh, it's rallied back up now to 45,000, but I mean, we've seen the increase in volatility there. A lot of that triggered by, um, as I always say, people trying to, to, to day trade Elon Musk's mood swings, but as well <laughs> as that kind of narrative coming out of various different central banks and governments around the idea of uh, well, legislating against cryptocurrencies, but also legislating for central bank digital currencies. What's your opinion on the development of central bank digital currencies going forward? Um, look, I think it's going to happen. Um, we know it's going to happen in China, right? I mean, that's that's already... They, they're already testing it in a few key places like Shenzhen. Um, so the digital renminbi is on the cards and it's coming. Um, now, you know, one of the big lessons I've taken from the past 20 years or so is that when 20 years or so we really start to integrate China into the global economy, we did so on the premise that, you know, as we did more business with China, they would basically become more Western as Taiwan had done before it and South Korea and Japan, and mm. they would become more like a Western democracy and, you know, and integrate with, with the rest of the world, not only economically, but politically as well. And of course this didn't happen, right? Um, uh, China instead uh, trailblazed its own path. And now we're sort of seeing, okay, the, the past 20 years of policy perhaps was a mistake. Um, the way we handle China. But so what I think we've seen, and I'm highlighting this because I think what we've seen in the past 20 years is uh, not China becoming more Western, but actually increasingly what we're seeing is the Western world becoming more Chinese. Okay. You know, remember, remember when Wuhan went into lockdown, everyone yes. in the Western world said, oh, this is crazy. You know, this is lack of civil civil rights. This is a dictatorship. Never could we do this in uh, in the Western world. And six weeks later, we were doing precisely that. Um, in 2008, when China was uh, putting pressure uh, on its banks to lend to businesses that were struggling, we said, "Ah, oh, this. You know, we can never do this in the Western world. This is, you know, banks have to make their own decisions, etc." And then comes COVID, and we do exactly that. We tell all the banks you have to lend to all the SMEs. Um, and so, you know, I, I look at this and, you know, I think the, the, the world, China does something and it does it, you know, supposedly for the greater good and Western policymakers look at it and say, oh, this is kind of nice. I'd like me some of that. Uh, I'd like, I'd like to do some of this. Um, so why is China pushing the cryptocurrency? Well, China is pushing the cryptocurrency or the, the, uh, the digital renminbi, uh, because it gives great power to the government. Uh, let's, you know, the government can look at everything you're spending your money on, where the money is uh, being spent. Now, you know, the, the top level of the Chinese Communist Party is all engineers. You know, the Standing mm -hmm. Committee of the Politburo, they don't have lawyers in there. They don't have, uh, they don't have economists. It is literally all uh, engineers. Um, and so they love the idea of having more data. You know, they love the idea of, oh, okay, the population is spending more money on this well, or this or that. It's like more buttons to push for them. Let's not forget that these guys are not only technocrats, but they're communist technocrats. But, you know, I think foreign policymakers will look at this and say, well, you know, China has this neat real-time picture of what's happening in their economy. I'd like that as well. So I think digital currencies are coming in everywhere. Now, you might say, well, hold on. That's a huge loss of privacy for people. Um, but the story of the past 10 years is really that people are willing to give up privacy for convenience every day of the week. 
you know, if you told me Sad 10, but true. I, it's, it's terrible, but if you told me 10, 15 years ago that people would put Alexa machines in their bedrooms, uh, I would have said, you're, you're, you're crazy. Like who, who would want a listening device in their bedroom? But there you are. Um, people have Alexas in their bedrooms. Um, look, our phones listen to us all day long. Mm. You know, you, you know, you, it's, so people give up the, the big message up for me, the big takeaway. And I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but it's obvious to me now. People give us privacy for convenience every day of the week. And this is what the this is where we're going in terms of digital as well. And in a world where central bank digital coins become much more prolific, is there still room for a Bitcoin? Um, well, I that's that's the part I don't think actually. I think you know, once once we move to, to digital currencies, um, and more importantly, once governments can track where you spend all your money and send it everywhere, et cetera, it makes holding bitcoins harder and harder. Um, so, yeah, no, maybe not. And finally, just to touch on gold and silver, um, we've had massive money printing, as we've already talked about over the yeah, last, well, of not not just, massive, it's, it's been accelerated over the last couple of massive, years. But, massive but, is a polite understatement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but over the last <laughs> decade and more, we've seen massive money printing. Um, we saw a run up in gold and it uh, made a new high within the last year, but since yep. then has struggled. Yep. Uh, and we touched down, we had a bit of a flash crash there uh, yep. just just in the last couple of days and it went below $1,700. Um, what do you think's going on in the gold market at the moment? Well, so uh, so two separate things. First is, you know, gold struggling a little bit the past couple months, number one. Number two is the, the recent flash crash. And mm-hmm. they might be separate things. Um, the flash crash, I'm not too hung up on, partly because, uh, you know, it occurred, uh, you know, basically in early trading hours, it occurred really on Sunday for the rest of the world in early trading hours in in Mm. Asia, um, when the market was highly, highly illiquid, you know, massive sell order coming in, you know, crushing, crushing the price. You could say, well, that smells like manipulation. And to me it does, but it's. You know these kinds of things they happen, but they, they don't last for 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 a long time. Um, more surprising, uh, perhaps, is the weakness of the past few months. Um, but then you know, gold is many things, right? Uh, it's an inflation hedge. It's uh, it's an insurance against the end of the world. It's you know, it's many many different things, and it's different things to different people. Um, but the one thing for me, one of the key things gold is, is it's actually a play on emerging markets. Um, okay, it's a play on emerging markets in that. When you look at where the demand for gold mostly comes from, it's from emerging markets, right? Roughly a third of physical demand comes from India. Another quarter to a third comes from China. Um, you know, people in the West, West in the rich Western world, actually don't buy that much gold. Um, they, you know, s- some people do. Uh, like very rich people might have five percent or ten percent of their assets in gold as an insurance policy of sorts, um, but you know, by and large, your typical saver, whether in France and Ireland and Britain, et cetera, they don't have gold. Um, but in China, in in Russia, in India, they do partly because they don't trust their governments, they don't trust their banking systems, or they don't trust their, their currencies that has been historically debased, or, you know, whatever the reasons, uh, or because, you know, you're, if you're China, you have a history of hyperinflation every 50 to 70 years. So, um, you know, they... The physical demand for gold is an emerging market story. And so usually when emerging markets do well, gold does well. When emerging markets do badly, gold does badly. Uh, Now, the reality is emerging markets have have had a shocker for the past three months. Um, You know, emerging market stocks have gotten crushed, um, nowhere more so than in China. And but if you look across emerging markets, you know, China, the problem was tightening. Latin America the problem was uh, basically a really uh, just bad COVID um, and bad COVID outtakes. South Africa, massive riots and also bad bad COVID uh, policies and, and outcomes. Um, so you look around the world, you're struggling today to find an emerging market that's doing okay. Perhaps Russia. Russia is the one that, that's doing quite well. Um, but with emerging markets struggling, gold struggles. Um, now, I actually tend to think this struggle in the emerging market is temporary. 
Um, you know, I think basically part a lot of it was linked to China's tightening. China's tightening is now over. So emerging markets will start outperforming once again. And with that outperformance, gold, gold should do okay. Now, the next hurdle for gold is that if I'm right that you know long bond yields come back up, that's never that great for gold either. Gold tends to do better when long bond yields go down rather than up. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe that's the next the next headwind for gold. Uh, having said that, I think that the tailwind of emerging markets doing well is more important than the headwind of of interest rates going up. Those have been some uh, fantastic insights. It's always great to catch up with you and pick your brains on the bigger pictures. Uh, you you have a, a fairly unique perspective on financial markets, and it's always it's always good to hear. Um, just before we wrap up, maybe you might remind our audience where they can learn a bit more about what it is that you do. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the plug. Um, so I'm not on social media, but uh, obviously we our company, GAFCAL, has a website that's uh, G-A-V-E-K-A-L. Uh, we publish research, we manage money, um, and uh, yeah, you can find out about everything we do through, through our website. It's probably the, the, the simplest, simplest uh, spot. Perfect. What I'll do is I'm going to put a link down in the show notes oh, to perfect. your website. So anybody who's interested can click on that and find out more about GavCal. But Louis Gav, thanks again for being on Goldcore TV. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll definitely enjoy these interviews with some of the leading voices in financial markets and trading. And remember, as always, if you want to see more interviews with industry experts and thought leaders in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit your notification bell now. And if you want to learn more about how you can buy, sell, and store physical gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts.